Hey, welcoming you all into the latest edition of the Inside the Walls podcast. Uh, a little bit different beginning this week before we kick into, as you can see on our title screen, our preview episode for the San Antonio Gunslingers. Is we had some massive news drop, not only just for one team in the league, but I think it's an NAL-based one I think that really is important. So if you can see on the title card, uh, touchdown Eddie Brown and his son Antonio Brown are joining the Albany Empire family. Now, like I said, it's to me that's a big that's huge news for the capital region, but for the NAL it's massive for exposure. Like uh, Jim will, Jim as he's joining in of course with me as well will attest. I mean, you and I can see that uh tons of different news outlets just from Antonio Brown's name being attached as a part owner, keep in mind key, he's a part owner to the league. Mike Corda and his family still are the majority owners of the empire, but Antonio Brown is now involved financially with the Albany Empire. His father, touchdown Eddie Brown, legend in the arena space, is now becoming the vice president of the Empire. So massive moves. I mean, quick thoughts here, Jim. Quick thoughts is uh, Eddie Brown is home. Uh, he became famous with the Albany Firebirds and and that city, that the city of Albany, that's gone through many arena teams. The Firebirds, the Conquest, the Empire, the Empire again. And it's finally, sometimes it's pretty cool to have someone return home. And in the arena game, selective cities have certain players that if that team or city, like for instance, for Jacksonville, uh, Aaron Garcia, for uh, the Arizona Rattler, Bonner. Like there's certain players that they'll come back and they're accepted instantly. And Albany, Eddie Brown is it. And a lot of people in the, in, in the arena scene, um, even outside the arena scene go, Antonio Brown is the son of Eddie Brown. They had no idea. Mm. And what's amazing is that with this news is the new fans are realizing that the National Arena League exists. Like, what? There's arena football being played? I never heard of it. And we've seen it on our social media. Uh, we've had, uh, I think, 15 new followers on uh, Facebook. We've had over 20 new additions on Twitter. It's amazing what the, what the attractions get. And when you have – Sports Illustrated, when you have ESPN, when you have NBC Sports, when you have Fox Sports, when you have other news outlets, especially the ones that cause drama like TMZ mentioning <laughs> right. you, um, you know you're getting um, recognition. And and you got a lot of people, you got a lot of players out there, former players that are reaching out to Albany or reaching out to these, like they know these leagues exist. It's pretty cool. Um, but we do know from sources inside Albany that AB, there's a big question, is AB going to play? The answer is no. no. Uh, he is done. He's retired, uh, and especially with Eddie Brown being the VP of the Albany organization. Um, the man has the records. Uh, he's a legend. Like He is the reason, like, I've watched arena football. When I watched back in the day, it was touchdown Eddie Brown because every time he touched the ball, he was in the end zone. Um, so for the city of Albany, it's a it's a great um, addition. Um, Antonio Brown is a big name. I don't care what sport he is. It's like when Terrell Owens went to the other arena teams a couple years ago. That everyone was talking about that arena team. Um, but for these for Albany for the Empire or for the Capital Region um, in Albany, it's going to be big, and I guarantee you, ticket sales will increase. Um, their ticket sales right now are doing very well from what I can see from my, uh, yeah, from Ticketmaster. Um, this just adds to the fire and Manas, Levesque, Mike Corda, now Antonio Brown and Eddie Brown. Um, they want to do something that's very rare in the sport. Um, three P only three other teams have a three P in their history in all arena leagues, AF, AFL, IFL, AF2, and now NAL only three teams have done that. Um, and they'll be a part of that if they complete it. So it's a it's a legacy. But again, this is a big addition for the league and a big addition for the Albany Empire. And it's something that sometimes it's good to bring the hometown boy back. And yeah, some teams know how to execute it. Uh, some teams know how to publicize it. And other teams is just like, oh, yeah, he's here. What? Well, yeah, whatever. Uh, but Albany did a great thing. He, they brought the hometown kid back. Uh, all, um, Eddie Brown's there. Antonio Brown went to elementary school there or middle yep. school there from what I read. And it, it seems like the city of Albany, especially the MVP arena and, I, and the coaching staff and the ownership, they're, they're excited to have this great addition. And, and it, for the, for the league stand wise, it's perfect. You get in more publicity. Maybe we may actually get more attention. It'd be cool looking at our YouTube streams and you get, 2,000 fans watching or 5,000 fans watching, except for this uh, usual 300 in some of these games. But it's good. It's good for the league, good for the Empire. And it's cool to see the, the story of the hometown can return home.
Pretty much. Uh, I mean, that's that's the deal. I think a lot of people don't realize that AB's dad, you know, had quite the has quite the arena legacy. Played for you know ten seasons from ninety four to two thousand and three, all with the Firebirds. Whether it was mostly in Albany or when they moved to Indiana and in Indi- when they played in Indianapolis back at the time when the AFL was kind of going into its boom years. Um, and I mean, it's it's special for them. We can tell in these quotes, which uh, were brought on basically with the press release about this. Um, dropping. So Antonio Brown, he's got some quotes here. I'll read off from the Empire's website. Um, Quote, I remember being here as a kid watching my dad play in this building, all the little kids with face paint cheering. So this is a, this is great for me to be here with my kids and my dad and give back to this community. Uh, I'm excited to be here and help bring these players in a community a three-peat. So obviously they're aiming, of course, back at another championship run. Eddie Brown has his own uh, words, of course, in on this here. Uh, everything right now is surreal. I'm home. Uh, life is great. We're excited to get started and do things the Empire way. Let's get three. Uh, quite quite a momentous occasion. I mean, if anything, like I reiterate, like you said, just the exposure that I think not just the, this team is getting, but just mm-hmm. the NAL getting its name out and having been connected on, you know, items for, say, TMZ Sports SI. Uh, yeah. You know, getting on getting on pages like that, Barstool Sports covering the press release. They had a post about that. You know, that's a big deal, um, at least in terms of exposure. Like the NAL doesn't usually get any level of something like this. So it is massive to have that name attached in terms of just getting people to look towards the league. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can only hope that, that keeps going up. With Arena Football, of course, returning this year, that should help a bunch. You know, Eddie Brown – knows that this isn't this is the stuff he played under you know mm-hmm. back when he was playing back in the day you know he was a specialist but you know he was playing around tons of of all iron man guys you know with the nets everything like that so he knows the deal you know that was well, his he, career he played <laughs> so, he, he played back when in the heyday when that was legit iron right <laughs> yeah i mean 94 was i mean that 94 is barely when the afl was existing it was only mm-hmm. it was only 7 years into its existence and he got to see it watch grow and thrive you know, as he was helping build up what its legacy was. So Eddie, now Eddie he gets Brown, help with the NAL doing that. Eddie Brown is the arena football version of Jerry Rice. He has yes, all the records. Yes, that, that's, that's a perfect comparison for him yeah. is that he's basically that. And and you look at past some of the past receivers that played here, you know, TJ uh, T. Uh, Tolliver, um, Jackson, uh, Tiger Jones. And, like, there, there are so many receivers that – in the 2000 version were great and he was he he set the records he still has the records and uh i know the darius prince there may be like you know what i'm gonna go after that record or devin wilson or someone who's who's they're active now you look at the the numbers compared you're like that's yeah, another 10 years away to even touch what eddie brown did um but again it, it, it's a great addition for an organization that is trying to reach out like we've said many many episodes before and many times before uh the nfl is about players the arena game is about the community Mm -hmm. and albany is doing their dangus to get this community fired up for arena football this season and for the national arena league so it's 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 cool because for me as a fan it's cool it's like oh man eddie brown's there it's be it's like i remember when i was a kid watching him he was the jerry rice he was the legit guy yeah um and it's also but you look at the you look at ESPN and you look at all the Twitter all the main channels. Uh, it's never Eddie Brown's his son Antonio Brown. And then you see these shows go Eddie, uh, Antonio Brown. Then you see what happens. You're like, yeah, he's retired. He's not playing. He's just he's connected with his father, going back home to Albany. And it's just amazing that it happens in the NAL at this time when the season's six weeks or five weeks away. It's mm-hmm. going to create a lot. Of, it created a lot of buzz in the last forty-eight hours, and that is something that the arena game desperately needs. And they did it well, and it's pretty cool uh, for me. Um, I've seen big-time ownerships come and stuff happen in previous generations of the sport that I don't want to, you know, go back to because it was disappointing. But I, this is not what you like to call a. It's an ownership group that's going to work for the community. Like Mike Quarter says, the Albany way, win a third championship, and you got Eddie Brown who's working with the organization. He's been there. He's done that. He has the records and he has the rings. So he knows what he's doing oh, there yeah. in Albany. So it's pretty cool. Uh, it's all, When the news broke, uh, I heard rumors about it weeks ago. I'm like, uh, really? No, but I didn't expect 
ownership well, I thought it was playing wise so I'm glad to then jump on that rumor but still it's a great addition for the city of Albany the Albany organization and the Empire so um, like they said get the community ready uh, and do the Empire way so it's a great great uh, in my opinion it's for me kind of jealous because I what what would Jacksonville's version would be it <laughs> Trevor Lawrence maybe Mark Brunell what's Orlando's version of it uh, Bobby Wagner Chris even mentioned that in the show today on the Albany Empire show yeah, uh, like Bobby Wagner would be that type of person for Orlando. So uh, it's cool. And, and same thing. And Albany has a mission and they've said it multiple times on many of their shows. And for the last two years, they're the king. They're on top of the mountain and they want to reclaim the top of the mountain. So there's a saying out there. If you come at the king, you better not miss. And they're really going to form it. They're forming up a team and organization where you have to come after king and you got to beat the king to become the champions. So, mm-hmm. So it, that's that's what it is, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and as Corda also put in his in their release, he had his own quote, basically saying that this is a move for sustainability. And again, as they've said since he's bought in as the majority owner, uh, they don't want they want Arena Football to stay here forever. Mm-hmm. Um, they that it's all about the capital region, Albany, right. getting its team, its professional sport to rally behind. You know, and they have their own dedicated scene with the Empire now a part of that. So. Yeah. You know, that's what this move also was about, too. And I think, you know, you guys should definitely be checking that, checking out if you're over there in the capital region. Hey, I mean, you know, now you got the Brown family behind it. You got, of course, a lot of upward mo- movement, two-time championship winning team looking for a three-peat now. Plenty of star players that you can rally behind that have been there for now several years. Um, things are looking good. Mm-hmm. You know, and for the league, that is a no- nod they can take in their cap that, Hey, helps highlight arena football. So good stuff. Well, that's, uh, yeah. F- anyways, uh, to the family, to the people who are l- listening to this show, you're like, we're talking about Auburn. This is supposed to be the San Antonio show. Well, please stand by guns mm-hmm. up. Episode a six is next. Covering all your favorite parts of the 50 yard fight. This is the inside the walls podcast with Zach Heilman and Jim Bernier. Welcome once again to the Inside of the Walls podcast. I'm Zach Common in here as always alongside my good buddy, pal and co-host Jim Mernier. Today we continue our team preview series for the 2023 NAL season. We are two. We are now two of the seven in. We are going to have the third here just momentarily. Last week we covered one of two Texas teams, the folks over in Odessa, Texas with the Warbirds. This week we're moving a little more centrally into the state as we are going to head over to San Antonio where the Gunslingers are going to be kicking off their second season in the National Arena League and looking to uh, build upon some of the successes uh, in terms of you know growing the fan base and also what they were building on in wins last year heading out of season one, I'll bring in of course as you'll see J- our head of uh, head of this show and co-host of this show here, Jim Mernier, coming on in. Jim, uh, as we just were talking leading in here, San Antonio. It is their preview show. First off, welcome aboard for those that have been tuning in for that, and thanks to the folks out there in 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 the Gunslinger Nation there for the support of this show, but look, um, quite a lot was going right for them at the end of 2022. Uh, fan base was growing exponentially. I think the last home game, they said they had 5,000 fans in the stands, which is for what, how it started out was excellent for this team. Um, they got plenty of great, they had plenty of great talent come in and they were rallying almost got into the playoffs. So it wasn't for two key losses come down the stretch. Uh, and they looked like they've retooled, um just to kind of tease into this they've they've kind of retooled to where you know you and i have talked all all off season they look like one of the deadliest teams in this league right now to where i fully expect them as one of the locks to be a playoff roster come come uh, july that is yeah words but yeah come july i i am i have them pre pre preseason prediction as them being one of the four locks for the playoffs that's not a shocker. Uh, you look at this roster and you look at what they've built this offseason. Uh, San Antonio did something that a lot of teams in the NAL or a lot of teams in arena can't do. And that's keep players on their roster. A lot of these players will move on or move to other teams and get picked up by other teams. Uh, San Antonio did a mission. They brought back players that were stars and they solidified their core and they brought 
big time free agents in to bolster that core. And again, the mention from last year, San Antonio, we've said a couple of times in this off season, especially last year that they caught on fire late and they ran out of the games. They were the carbon copy of the main mammoths back in the day where mm-hmm. early, first half of the season, they just couldn't get out, out of their own way. In the second half, they came, you know, crashing back to reality. And this in the second half, they take it over. I mean, first half, then second half, they took it over in the second, uh, second half. Yeah. Um, they lost two games in the back and then back into their schedule where if they would have won one and one in that stretch, they could have, snu- they could have snuck in by- and behind like back door their way into the playoffs behind Jacksonville. Um, but that the key crucial loss, they went toe to toe with San Antonio the final week of the season and they, you know, missed there. That was a crucial game there too. Cause if they would have won with the Jacksonville loss, they would have um, got in over Jacksonville. Um, the San Antonio has a team. They brought back key additions. They uh, brought back the coach, uh, Charles, back. Yep. And, of course, the ownership group, John Wayne uh, ownership group, Cody Brooks and I talked about how what's what's been going on this offseason, how they've been doing on uh, the promotion-wise and the, the social media game is, you know, expert. They're elite. Uh, and it's a, a an offseason where we were thinking, how will they capitalize and move forward? And, of course – they exceeded our expectations, in my opinion. It's one thing that we've learned about San Antonio over the last year and a half is they have a dedicated fan base. They have mm-hmm. a dedicated podcast over there that likes to talk. Um, they're kind of busy right now with other another uh, sport right now. But they're a fan b- group that we saw the growth. The OG3 ownership group, are, they're a good group. Um, they decided to, you know, give it to John Wayne. John Wayne took it and, you know, ran with it and their attendance increased i think to five thousand six thousand was the attendance in the last home game um so mm-hmm. there there's some energy there's there it's it's a positive outlook to a team uh, from last year now this year they have key additions coming back they have a the, the, the main one qb if you have a qb you're going to win and they got a guy who's been there and done that and who has won. And like you, you should say they're a top four team. I do think they're a top four team in the NAL. They're a lock in my opinion uh, to win uh, seven to eight games to get you in um, because 500 gets you in, in the, in the, in the NAL playoffs, no matter what year it is, besides the, uh, uh, the year, the shortened season, the two one one where Orlando, no, Carolina, got Ca- Carolina, they made their rally late in yeah. the year. That was the, um, remember, that was the season that we had suggested, uh, you know, <laughs> some oh, player yeah, fan, additions. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, th- they were almost a 500 team last year. They're clearly above a 500 team this year. So it, it's, it's pretty cool uh, for me uh, because we've hyped this up and we've had our people behind the scenes like, well, you guys are just dedicated San Antonio fans. I'm like, no, not really. Uh, we just we just love their additions. We just love what they're doing this off season. And of course, to you fans out there who want to get to San Antonio games, visit the gun, San Antonio Gunslingers dot com or Ticketmaster. Tickets are on sale now. See the yeah. single game and season tickets. Uh, go visit them there at San Antonio Gunslingers dot com. But speaking of additions, this is the roster for well i got a lot if you're on the screen of youtube page ladies and gentlemen i do apologize let me move all this <laughs> stuff out of the way technology here's uh the roster of a couple of players that you well, you'll see some guys who are you, you know familiar cody brooks jonathan taylor nico thomas pierre turner these are guys who are definitely returning to the team that are, are additions that could um put them from that you know three or four seed, possibly two, maybe a one seed, depending on how the season breaks, uh, depending on how everything else goes around the league. But the, the key ones that we I want to you know point out is the return of uh, Philip Barnett, a, a, a savvy vet. The guy, was he's been a beast in his whole career. Yep. The weapon of all weapons that you need, Drew Pearson. You need a kicker this day and age, especially with the Nets and the new rules. You definitely need a good kicker. Oh, yeah. And, of course, we can't say anything without Khalid Rashad, the superstar that came out of nowhere. Well, for us, came out of nowhere. But for the fans of San Antonio, they said, oh, we've known him for a couple of years. He came out and shined for them last year. Now, out of these additions, what makes this roster even better is the free agents that they got. 
the big additions this year is Arthur Hobbs, who comes from the uh, Albany Empire, and Jonathan Bain, who is a journeyman in the arena game, played at Maine Mammoths, played in Carolina last year, won championship in Jacksonville, and now he's with the San Antonio uh, Gunslingers. So their roster is pretty loaded, and they did a very good job from building their core players coming back from Nico Thomas, Pierre Turner, uh, Kyler Shad, Drew Pearsons, um, Philip Barnett, bringing those guys back. And you put on top of that Arthur Hobbs and Jonathan Bain. They have a elite, a, a very elite squad, I can say. Are they championship caliber? Every team in this league is championship caliber. You just got to go out there and win games. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, those additions, especially with Jonathan Bain and Arthur Hobbs, um, mixed in with Philip Barnett and Kyler Rashad, that's a solid, solid offensive threat. And, of course, defense, because Kyle Leeds said on the show before, he he doesn't mind playing DB. He likes to shut down people, too. So it's a it's an intriguing roster, and it's a roster that, honestly, is pretty dang good. I, you know, it's, oh, a pretty, it it's a pretty dang good roster. And, again, it comes down to coaching. It comes down to quarterback play, and it comes off. It comes down to execution. You can have the best roster on paper. If you can't execute, you're not going to win games. I don't care what sport you're in. Right, right. No, it's a good roster. I mean, it's that's why we hype it up so much. It's a really great roster. I mean, you're talking, like I say, you got the returning folks, of course, that I think are important, that are extremely important here, of course, that are like the Pierre Turners of the world, the Cody Brooks of the world, you know, Khalil Rashad. I like that they got Philip Barnett back. You know, the question was going to be about quarterback because Robert Kent, you know, very much was, you know, getting up on age, but still could sling it. He was getting things down at the end of the season. So, you know, having Jonathan Bain to kind of come in, who, you know, sure, ended on a low note in the NAL championship in Albany. But overall, you know, pre-injury in San Antonio was on pace to kind of be in the contention, if not the NL NAL MVP. So, you know, don't go don't go away and kind of judge off that last game. Dude is a baller. Like, he's a star in this league. Um, the league's glad to have him in that player ecosystem. And especially for the gunslingers, you're going to be thrilled to have him as your guy taking over the reins from Robert Kent. So without a doubt, excellent addition that they got him to come over. And I think there's a few others on this roster that you have to be happy that they picked up. Like you mentioned Arthur Hobbs. Hobbs, honestly, um, massive addition for the sake of, I think that he, last year in Albany, I felt they got, kind of got lost in the, in the shuffle a little bit and you know, 2021, he was a key cog in that championship run for the Empire. So having him as a good baseline DB or possible receiving threat and playing Iron Man, you know, he'll be a great addition. Uh, speaking of another addition from the Empire, Calvin Fance. I think that one cannot go understated. Another good role player for the Empire that signed on for the Gunslingers as well. So having someone like that come over with that championship, uh, at least knowledge of pedigree, you got to be appreciative of that. I mean, Phil Barnett, we talked enough last year how remember he was also on that 2021 empire roster so he knows where they need to go to get to where they need, of course need to finish things off and like i said i love these additions here you know getting like someone again dante agnes another one that i thought was a good contributor last year on the line for the gunslingers they brought a lot of guys back like you said that's a really important piece especially for how well the that this roster played at the end of the season now they get a whole off season under fred shaw's unit um a little a lot more security in terms of how the ownership group is structured and what they are looking to do. You know, John Wayne having a full offseason saying, this is our team, this is our group of guys, you know, and this is a, you know, this is an operation that's run, you know, family-wise in multiple forms. I mean, the Felix family, you know, Carlos Phoenix is the director of football, but he has his two sons part of the coaching staff, honestly, under Fred Shaw. That's what I think is amazing. You see something like that. Or you also talk about the rest of the staff as well. The, uh, Stoop, the Stebling family, you know, you have James Stebling, chief operating officer, but also he has his daughters who are helping with sales and graphics, and they've been doing a fantastic job. So, like, this is a big family effort on all phases of the board, and it's been run really well. And I think this also can't be understated, too. You know, Fred Shaw was doing this mainly by mainly on his own in terms of being the main coaching presence last year. They got Jeremy Richardson as an assistant coach, which – you know, like I said, talk about some additions from the Empire. He's another one I think that was a key one that they brought in that he's going to be able to kind of, you know, sh flex a bit more of his coaching chops, you know, with Fred Shaw. Um, and, you know, obviously both of those are experienced guys. Both played in the arena scene. Both know how to play this game. And both know how to play the original arena style. Keep that in mind, too. So good to have all that experience. I think you talk about returning. There's so much returning just beyond the roster 
that you love where San Antonio has to be at right now if you're going into week one. They, they, you have to feel really good as a fan seeing what's available right now for the Gunslingers. Well, you have to be feeling good. That's a new season, and you, you were so close last season. And there was a couple of games last season that you know, the, the last second win by Jacksonville and Jacksonville are for the, the Sharks, that if that was the other way around, Jackson, uh, or San Antonio's in the playoffs, you had the games where they struggled early in the year, especially at Orlando and at Columbus, that they were still trying to get themselves, find their, find themselves as an organization. Then they mm-hmm. finally click somewhere between week five, week six. And when we look at teams, usually when we've talked to Kendrick Gings before, uh, starting off hot is great. Um, but you can get burned out because you started so hot, and usually the team that ends up where they're at at the end of the year is the team that knows how to catch on fire at the right time. And for San Antonio, they caught on fire at the right time. Unfortunately, they hit the road. They hit you know ran out of the games, but again, they lost the last two games of the season that really ended their hot streak uh, to really get in. Um, but there, again, you have a couple players, especially the, the addition of the coaches. Uh, you know, the term they say up in Albany is Albany way. Apparently Fred Shaw's like, you know what, let's get that Albany way down in San Antonio. And hopefully they can, you know, propel that into a championship <laughs> right down in San Antonio. Uh, it's, there's a couple guys on there like Agnet, like Angus, you just mentioned that guy was a complete beast last year for San Antonio. He caused yeah. so much havoc up there on um, the, but the guys that you, you look at this roster, the one, of course we, we know what Jonathan Bain's going to do. We know what Arthur Hobbs is going to do because Arthur Hobbs did it in San, uh, in Albany last year. And that was a loaded roster. They, they, you know, I'm the type of guy that likes to give credit where credit to do. Um, in this day and age, especially with the new rules that we'll talk about later on the show, uh, you need a kicker. And Drew Pearson became yes. a weapon for San Antonio. Uh, and when he, I think he was one of the few kickers that were was kicking deuces with the old ball. And now the uh, today on the Albany Empire show, Chris, Commissioner Chris Sigbury said that they're going to have the white football back. But it's going to be the white football that has been played in the past NAL championship games, not the last year's white football. So there will be more deuced attempts for kickers. But also, you need a good kicker this day and age, especially with the Nets and the new rules, where if you don't have an accurate kicker, you could be giving the opponent points for not you know, hitting good kicks. Um, but overall, you look at this roster – Again, this roster is going to change before the first game against the Cobras. You look at who you think is going to start. In my opinion, that's one of the best, better rosters in the league. It's not the best, but one of the better rosters in the league. And it's led by veterans. It's led by skilled players. It's led by some elite wide receiver talent. And mm-hmm. you have a solid core of players. Usually when you look at a lot of ring teams, especially what's happened up in Albany a couple of years, they have kept the core together. You keep cores together, you'll win consistently. And San Antonio got kept that core together. So this season is going to be even more, um, you can say, chemistry, more balance. And hopefully this season for San Antonio and for their fans, they have a chance to excel that from a four-win campaign to a eight-win campaign. Again, ladies and gentlemen, they have 12 games this year. They don't play 14 like five other yep. teams. So eight and four is pretty good. And that winning percentage will – be ben- you can say it could be beneficial to San Antonio, or it can be a deterrent. It depends on how their season goes. Um, but again, eight and four right now. If I looked at the schedule, uh, the last simulation I did on our Discord, which the link is in our description, um, I had San Antonio in our simulation at nine and three, and winning uh, winning the championship game in our last simulation. So that happens every week. So that's possible. But every simulation I've done so far, San Antonio's either been eight and four, or nine and three, or ten and two. Um, so just depending on how – what's well, a stupid computer graphic, by, by the way, but <laughs> no no strange math. It's just who wins? Boom. Oh, okay. Ryan's on, so the computers are telling me that San Antonio's win. But um, San Antonio uh, is going to be a solid team. Uh, I really have – if you – season tickets are on sale again. Um, and how uh, John Wayne's been doing with advertising. Um, first home game's a couple weeks, March, April 8th. Yep. I think a place is going to be jam-packed. I think that place is going to be rocking, and I think they're going to have one of the better teams in the league. And for San Antonio fans, I think you're going to have a playoff caliber team, just what me and Zach said. So it's going to be pretty entertaining. And for me to cover it, I'm excited for it. I Hopefully we have some great uh, football, especially the first game against Carolina. Uh, you get 
Jonathan Bain playing his former team. So it's got a little bit of a, uh, you could say it's a little bit of a revenge factor. I don't even know there's a revenge factor. Um, don't know <laughs> if there's any hatred there. I don't know Coach Fuller and Bain have a history. They've followed each other. And this is the first time they pretty much haven't played with each other or uh, coach and played with each other. So it's going to be entertaining. But what we did do, I was, we were joined by Cody Brooks uh, earlier this week. And I had to have, I had a pleasure Excuse me, I'm I'm crying. I'm having difficulty breathing for some odd reason. I've had the pleasure of of talking to uh, a linebacker slash fullback Cody Brooks of your San Antonio Gunslingers. Ladies and gentlemen, to this week's edition of Inside the Walls podcast, our special guest for this week on episode 86, Guns Up, is linebacker slash fullback. Cody Brooks of the San Antonio Gunslingers. Cody, welcome to the show, man. Um, Thanks for having for, me. Uh, pre- appreciate it. Well, uh, unfortunately, if people are watching us right now, there's a where's Zach? Uh, well, <laughs> time constraints. I decided to take over. Uh, Cody, I know you're. When people think of San Antonio Gunslingers, they think basically you. You were there from the beginning, from when they're in the AAL and now in the NAL. Okay. How has the transition in the last three years of the Gunslingers organization been in your eyes, seeing that you are on the ground? Man, it's been a night and day change from that first year. If you see, I just ha- I got a reminder today from our schedule from the first year, mm-hmm. and that just reminded me is like, dang, the, the progress that we've come from then to now is, is imaginable from – everything like cause th- we were playing in a, a horse arena the first year because it kind of we were supposed to play at the freeman but then at the last minute they used it for mm-hmm. the COVID uh facility so they scrambled that was the closest thing we could find but yeah no if, you, if anybody saw the kurt warner movie about, about the ring it was exactly like that we were in a, a horse arena where you can legit go walk by some horses right right in the back and then, I mean, and then ownership too. Um, I mean, uh, nothing against the original guys, but last year they kind of bit off a little too much of what they could handle. And But with John Wayne, man, uh, they there is a phenomenal organization from top to bottom. Uh, they've done so much to try to take care of so many guys. Um, Cause you know, the scheduling last year, we, we had three week, uh, three practices a week and then game week, depending on where, if we were leaving on Friday, it's in that where that's five days that you might have to miss work. So some dudes got cut and John Wayne was like, well, Hey, we'll, we'll bring you on and you know, we will give you a job and you can make some extra money. So I thought that was very big of them to do that. Cause not everybody, they didn't have to do that. Huh. So, I mean, and then, then um, overall just, um, Everything from the cheerleaders to the, the uh, in between the game, uh, the little races that they do, we didn't have none of that the first year. So um, it's, it's night and day of how much we've grown from that first day, from that first year. First year. Well, it's, sure. it's definitely an upgrade uh, from, your, from your first couple of years to now you're playing with Nets coming back for the National yeah. Marine League. Interested to see about that, yeah. Um, especially you just mentioned John Wayne, they are one of the top. I think social media pushes of every organization this year. San Antonio, like every single day, you see something on either Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, pumping about San Antonio gunslingers. And you guys were recently with the Brahmas, didn't you? Had something with the Brahmas just past? Oh uh, yeah, so uh, they actually invited us out to their first game, and we were out there uh, tailgating and just uh, enjoying that little atmosphere. And it was, it was really fun. Uh, wish mm-hmm. we could, they could have got the dub that game. Uh, that was when they played the Battle Hawks, but um, uh, it was a very um, nice. And but, man, they had like twenty four thousand in that, that the first game. Well, San Antonio loves football. Texas in, in itself loves football. Oh, oh, yeah, that's. I mean, Zach talk about other shows, especially here in Florida, too. It's like there's three things. There's God, football, and family in any order. That's Texas, and that's Florida. Uh, but speaking of San Antonio, speaking of that city, uh, last year, you guys slowly progressed. It was like a, it was a, like a battle, basically. You, early season mistakes, expansion team ex- mistakes, and you started to get your ground towards the end of the year, especially you seeing the fans. The fans went from just, you know, patch here, patch here. Then in the last home game, there was almost six, 7,000 people in that building. You could tell the evolution of San Antonio from week one last year to week 17 last season. And now you look at this off season, the vibe and the energy that's coming out of San Antonio is night and day compared to this time of last season. As a player, 
as a player, what's the re what's the reason for? Is it management? Is it just the, the fans around the city are now knows that oh we actually have another football team here? Or uh, what, I would what, oh, I'm sorry. What's causing ahead. it? Oh, I was asking, what's causing oh, it? What's uh, making I, them? I would say the, the the main the biggest reason I would have to say is John Wayne. I mean their reach in San Antonio. I mean they they have connects to the radio station. They could pull an ad just like that. Um, if they want to show something on TV. Just like, just like I said, if they want to show it on case case at one of our local channels. Mm -hmm. They could snap a finger and they could have something displayed within uh, that day, probably. So their 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 pool of be able to, just like you said, be able to push stuff out, and they're mm -hmm. they're so broad, and it's not just even San Antonio. It's like within like 50 mile radius outside of San Antonio. So like they're they they have a big following. So when they put when they put something out there, that they, uh, there's a lot of eyes already out there. So well. I know as for John Wayne, they're, I think, the largest AC company in San Antonio, or one of them. And I know yeah. they're big because a lot of NASCAR, I'm not a NASCAR fan, but I've noticed that they have a NASCAR, or they have a NASCAR that's John Wayne. So, yes, sir. Me, me, me and Zach, uh, we, we kind of agreed, like, bash each other, but it's like, you don't put the John Wayne name on a company unless it's good. And... And legit, Absolutely. they came in. They came in, I think, like week four, week five during the season, and they just escalated <laughs> the promotion. Uh, listen, enough talking about John Wayne. We know what John Wayne's all about. Uh, entering this season, you have some studs returning. You have Philip Barnett, you have Kyler Rashad, and you have Jonathan Bain, who's been there and done that. Um, yes, what are you looking forward to this season in San Antonio, especially with that team being assembled with you on it, of course, this year? Uh, yeah, man. Um, seeing the guys that we added this off season, and then not only that, but you know, from last year, the most like I would say about seventy percent of that team was the original AAL team. So, and out of those people, I want to say Pierre was the only one that had previous arena experience. So, arena was still we were still learning the game. And then on top of that, the coach we had the first season that was a first year coach that didn't last long, and it just in, in a league that was very poorly ran. So it, we were still trying to learn football, and that we um, most of the guys that um, I've talked to, they said like once the once the uh, like the end of the season, they started they started clicking, and it became familiar with them because not only that, like you said, like Barnett, man, he he was a huge part of our locker room, just being a vet and learning from him. Those those guys, I mean, so unfortunately. I didn't finish the season last year. I don't know if many uh, people know, but uh, I left uh, last year um, after week three. Um, personal reasons. I had a lot of uh, things outside of football that I had to take care of. And so, um, but I was still, I was still, I got to see the growth of that team. I still was at home games. And um, uh, I think with the team that we have, um, and it's a, it's a championship for us, man. I, I don't care what nobody says. Um, we have the talent. We have the experience now. And, and and we have a lot of dudes that are, have a lot to prove, and uh, that are hungry. And uh, there's no reason why we can't be at the end of the season holding the, the championship in our hands. So besides you, who you think is going to be the stud of the team? Like last year, we had Kyle Lee Rashad come out of nowhere and <laughs> shock everybody. Who? Let's. We already know about him. Who? Who's going to be the yeah. other guy that's going to show up? Um, man, you know, I'm I'm interested to see it with my own eyes. Uh, I'm I'm ready to see what Bang could do for us, man. Because I mean, that was the last game I played last year, and he he put he put up some numbers against us. So, uh, I'm interested to, to, to actually uh, play uh, not only. Uh, practice again and learn from him you know uh because that i didn't get to pl uh, play much with robert last year so i didn't get to really have a vet quarterback so i didn't really get no knowledge like that so um be able to have him in our locker room knowing the game and in and out um i think he'll be a huge part of our success this year for sure well, positive and as a person who's covered san antonio from this year and next year and follow a couple of these players I've been preaching this offseason that San Antonio is building a squad. If you see on our Inside the Walls Twitter, we've been doing that for a couple of weeks now. And there's some teams out there that don't like us showing, like, hey, they got this player, they got this player, saying that we're too biased or we're San Antonio fans. It's it, it, it I, how a couple of people say, like, I like the smoke. Like, like come at me. Like, hey, my, my job is to promote. My job is to promote. But, uh, yeah, I, the one thing I noticed about San Antonio, especially from last year, uh, when we weren't in, we have a thing with, I know you noticed the power rankings we do, 
and we get a lot of heat from that depending on who's seven, <laughs> who's one. And last year we had San Antonio at seven a lot during because it was just an introduction to the team. Then we yeah. saw the, the you know Pierre, then we saw Khalid, and we saw you know Robert Kent like move that team up. This year in the power ranking, you guys, you guys are up top. You're number I think we had yet number three. And everyone said, "Oh, they're bandwagon fans." Do as a pl- as a player, I, we've asked this to uh, last week. We asked uh, Kerry Starks, and a couple of weeks ago, we asked uh, Kinger Ings. Do power rankings drive you, or do you just ignore it and just ignore it as a, as a noise? Uh, it it's always a, it, it depends. Uh, I would say for the most part, it, it's been a driving force because I mean we're we're a new team; no one really knows about us, so. Um, I mean, it's something new that no one knows. So you got to go with the unknown, right? And then for me personally, I mean, I didn't even really get to play my season last year. I only played three games, and it was at a position that I got kind of pushed to because we had injuries at the, end, the beginning of the season. So I was playing DN at 220 soaking wet. So, I mean, it was no, it was no, it was an ideal situation. So, I mean, I definitely, I'm definitely hungry because, uh, uh I seen the linebackers were a little low on the list this year, so uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, it's a, it's definitely a driving force for sure. But again, speaking of you being a linebacker and a fullback, I asked a question, Kerry Starks. It's basically in the arena game, it's one on one. If you win your one on one matchup, you win the play, and it could possibly be the determining factor. The MAC linebacker is. What Kerry said and what uh, Nick Haggis said, it's the most determining p- position in arena. In your opinion, mm-hmm. you played you played a couple of games last year. Who is that fullback that give that brings the best out of you as a linebacker for San Antonio? Hmm. Uh, I can't remember his name, but it was it was actually the first game, or it was Orlando. I, I think he was number eighteen, I, if I can remember correctly. I don't remember his name though, but he uh, he 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 definitely he brought, definitely brought it. He, you know, the guy, and like I'm a guy who likes to talk, so yeah, he was one that uh, also was like a guy that liked to talk back. So uh, that also drives me. So because uh, uh, I know I don't I don't like to be quiet out there. It's it's, it's just it's boring if you just go out there and just be blah and just play football. I like some little smack talking back and forth, bring a little bit more energy into the game. So uh, now I don't remember his name, but. Uh, uh, he was definitely one of the best. And um, Carolina uh, was the last game where I played. Uh, Zach Brown. Brown, yep. Yeah, Zach Brown. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's definitely that dude back there as well. Uh, I got to chat to him after the game. Uh, he, w- I actually had, I, could I, could I, um, had I explained to him my situation after the game, and he kind of wanted me to stay. But, uh, um, yeah, uh, it was, uh, that dude's a beast back there for sure. Uh, a lot of the fans, like, and especially our listeners, uh, they like background stories for our players. Because arena games, there's a, they're stars in arena, but if they're not, you know, highlighted, people say, oh, he's just, oh, that's number nine, that's number eight, that's number 15. Catch the ball. Why are you missing that tackle? Why are you holding it? They never know <laughs> the background of a player. Just tell the fans and listener, uh, the listeners what made you become an arena player, which um, – What's your, um, how can I say, what is your passion? What is your force? What's keeping you in this game? And do you have goals beyond just arena, maybe the upper level leagues um, in your future? Uh, yeah, no, it's, um, I definitely have goals of going bigger. Um, I kind of got introduced to the arena league because when uh, that first year, it was just kind of, um, a thing that kind of fell in my lap, kind of, uh, when they started the Gunslingers, the head coach that was going to be at the time, um, the year before I had played semi-pro, it was, mm-hmm. I was just trying to get back to doing some football, moving around, never would do it again in my life. Uh, but the co- our coach on that team was going to be the coach for the, uh, the Gunslingers. So it just kind of fell in my lap to, Hey, you can go play ball and actually make some money while doing it. And then, you know, it just kind of just went off of there. Um, I did uh, go off into the XFL tryout after season um, uh, with the, the Dallas Showcase. Obviously, that didn't work out for me. But um, definitely, I have aspirations to keep moving on. Dallas Showcase. That was uh, 
was that for the, the, the very last league? one? The very last one, yeah. We had we. There's other couple of XFL um, NAL players that got went to there had an opportunity to go to XFL. One of your former teammates went into. I think he went to the Brahmas and. Yeah. Uh, so it, there's opportunities there. So the one the one thing that I like about stories about players is it's the trials and tribulations that a player has out of college. Maybe they're NIA or D2, D3, and, and they are always overlooked because they don't have that D1 label. And they get into arena and they shine. Uh, one of the things that that in, that make, attracts me to the arena game is I like small ball. I like D3. I like D2 because there's, there's studs in these leagues that – they don't get a chance in the spotlight. So they make the arena game their NFL right. and they dominate as a player. Was there a chance in, in as a linebacker or as receiver or as defensive end that you were like, you know what, I'm going to be the, you know, LT of the arena league, or I'm going to be you know, the next great stud in the league. Um, this is a difficult question to ask. A lot of the players like did this escape around it, but all. Um, what is the what is the impact you want to leave it behind in the arena game, in the community wise, as a player wise, and as an individual wise? What's what's your striving force to leave a legacy behind? What is what do you want people to remember you years from now? It's like oh, Cody Brooks did this, this, and here. Uh, that uh, I always uh, I gave our best foot on the field, man. I uh, put my heart out there. Uh, this is something that um, a few years ago, a lot of people don't know that I was told that it was going to be taken away from me and I would never play again. Um, I had ba uh, back surgery and it was a tough recovery. Um, there was times that I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up, but I couldn't. And I finally kept pushing through and that's that's really my motivation is because man, I I have a testimony to show that I, I'm I was told I wasn't gonna be here and I'm here and now I I just want to let people know that um you're gonna get the best of me every time I step on that field because I never know when it's gonna be my last and I just want to know that yeah I know that I, I'm gonna play with my heart and that I give everything I got every time I step on the field. That's an inspiration story right there coming back from a bad back. For me, I played football in high school. Didn't get any offers. Well, I get an NAIA school offer, but I was that individual is like, no, I'm D1 talent, and I never took that NAIA deal. And oh, what happens? I'm covering sports. I'm playing it. Um, but, <laughs> um, like you, I had a massive ankle injury in high school and kind of a torn ACL, but it really wasn't torn. They say it was torn, but it never was. Um, yeah. It sidelined me, and they said, you're never going to play again. And I went in that mentality like, okay, it's over. It's done. I'm done. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't go out there. You know what? I'm going to fight back and get back in the game. Never did. I just quit. <laughs> but that's something you 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 went up and took over me. I folded. So we're two different yeah. type of individuals. But we played on both sides of the ball. That was a D tackle. You're a linebacker. So my well, job at the was time, in the well at the time I was actually playing defensive tackle because that was when I was at Sam Houston. So I was I actually got forced into that. So I had moved. I had transferred over. I was like 250. We had some defensive tackles quit, and they were like, "Hey, we're gonna move you inside." And so uh, I think that's part of it too. Yeah, no, that, that was part of it. When seasons, that was right when we came back from uh, Christmas break, and when season started, I was pushing close to two ninety. That's a lot of bulk. That's a lot of gym time right there, putting mass on. Yeah, two fifty per D tackle is. <laughs> so it not it definitely wasn't a healthy way, and it definitely eventually caught up to me. So um, yeah, no, uh, every every pound passed probably two sixty. I hated every second of it. So for me, I had no issue with keeping the weight on. The <laughs> it's like if I'm not if someone beats me or like through my my gap, I'm like oh. Hope the linebacker got him and eventually looked back and was like, oh, he's gone. And they're like, nope, that's my problem. I, I didn't, you know, collapse on that A, uh, the A gap or B gap. Um, but yeah, when people look at me now, they, they don't believe that I was almost 300 at one point. From all the photos I've seen you with the gunslingers, no, you don't, you don't look like you were <laughs> no, a, a one technique D lineman. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, let, let's uh, let's close out the, uh, the interview uh, show about this season. 2023 is here. You guys have 12 games this year. Unlike the five other teams in the league that have 14, you have an extra that extra bye week. Um, now, 
would it would that been I know it's beneficial of a lot you know healing you know some getting tra- training and during a long season those bye weeks do help with the 12 game season you get two extra extra bye weeks so you get the extra rest over the other teams you play everyone twice is there a team out there that you look on that schedule and you go I want to circle that game that's the game I'm looking forward to this year I want the champs. I didn't get to play against them last year, so uh, I def I want, want to go against the champs. I didn't play either one of those games last year, so I want the champs. Well, you were the team that upset the champs earlier. That they were the first ones uh, last year, which I predicted mm-hmm. it. My co- my colleague did not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Twelve game season. We asked a lot of players about how how to manage their workload. Is it based off scheme? What position you play, or is it based off what the coach wants you to do, um, scheme wise, or you know, staying healthy for a 17 week season? I mean, you're with 17, so you got 12 games in that 17 week span. Uh, I would just say just find a good balance. You, uh, just knowing the the coach and on be able to know the player. I mean, and you got to know what kind of injury it is, and, and you got to know what, uh, be able to how to handle it. Like um, that's another thing. Like last year, a lot of people don't know, I, I had a, a wrist injury that I got in the Carolina game, and honestly, I didn't have full flexion after that game. Like I would, probably wouldn't have played too many games after that season. So, I mean, yeah. So it's just it's just a fine line of uh, just knowing what to push, what not to push, um, and then just. Um, just knowing how to take care of your body, but um, that's something that I took a lot um, more important this off season. Um, doing range of motion stuff, pliability, um, staying on my stretch, and make sure that I'm doing all the what I'm supposed to do, lifting the right way, doing uh, warm ups the right way, taking care of my body way more. Um, been going to um, mas- doing massages, no Deshaun Watson stuff, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, uh, acupuncture, uh, cryotherapy, just really uh, just doing more, taking care of my body, because that's something I haven't done in the past. And then this 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 season, I trained a lot harder to just do it the right way, not just being a bodybuilder in the weight room. That's for me as a lineman back in the day. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was so hard because we played game Friday and then Saturday we had what we call recovery day. Everyone came up and you walked through. A light stretch, probably yeah. ice bath. Myself, I was just soaking the ice bath because I was always sore. Like, like, <laughs> no, I was, like you don't understand what D line go through, especially in the state oh, of Florida. But yeah, even um, now, uh, true, <laughs> true. Um, another question. This was sent by a fan. Uh, okay. Your jersey number eight from last year. Are you <laughs> are you going to wear number eight this year, or are you going to decide to switch it up? I am going back to number eight. <laughs> I'm not changing my number. <laughs> okay. We had a question. Uh, we asked ask our listeners send questions, and one of the San Antonio fans says, "Is Cody staying number eight? Ask him, please." And I was like, "I'll ask him in the interview." Yes, so, I will yeah. be number eight. And the only reason the the dudes that got it were last year is just they they didn't want to order new jerseys, more numbers. They just take the name tag off, place it on. It's very simple fix. So that I think those dudes, I think Chandler and. Uh, um, Barn Barnett were the two that wore it, so I think they have their own jerseys this year. The ones that, that they actually want to wear. <laughs> and also, uh, is there anything new coming from San Antonio jersey wise? Is there new combinations? Maybe uh, all black or anything? Because that's one thing about you know as a player that this day and age jerseys are the thing. What are the teams wearing each day? Because NFL teams they do a, a like a Tuesday or Wednesday. They're like this is what we're wearing this Sunday. Is, is there anything coming for San Antonio that you get the fans ready, or is it just classic San Antonio blue and white? There could possibly be something. <laughs> I'm not uh, – I heard there there could be something. I don't want to – I'm not going to say there is, but there could be something. Could be something. <laughs> I'm sorry. So look, I, I, we asked that to Kendrick Ings. He's like, uh, yeah, we got New Jersey's coming because we haven't debuted in New Jersey's yet. <laughs> so I was like <laughs> – uh, uh, anyways, Cody. I'm sure. I'm sure ownership. I'm sure. Owner, I'm pretty sure ownership has something up their sleeve that they want to bring out. So, because I, mean, I know last year those weren't the jerseys that they they probably wanted. Those were the original owners' jerseys. So maybe they want something a little bit different. So we'll see. Yeah, 
Well, Cody, uh, I want to say thank you uh, for joining uh, Inside the Walls podcast. I wish Zach was with here uh, with us today, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Absolutely. but I couldn't leave you hanging again for the second straight game day in a row. So, hey, um, tell the fans how they can follow you on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, anything, and to see if they can All follow right. the life of Cody Brooks. Oh, uh, yeah. So, my Facebook is Cody J. Brooks, um, i.e., I. not with a Y. And then my um, Instagram is uh, EP underscore the CB way eight. Um, that's uh, for my training. I do personal training. So uh, if you uh, wanted to get some video, learn some gym stuff, how to take care of your body, I'm um, the guy to follow. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is uh, linebacker. Are you playing fullback this year or are you just being special as linebacker? You're playing both positions, right? Uh, I'm probably going to – I'm leaning more to special. I'm trying to get Coach <laughs> Shaw to put me on the outside, but we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. I think, I, think, I think our depth at receiver is pretty deep right now, so I don't think they're going to need me on that side of the ball. No. Especially with Phil Barnett and Kyle Rashad, they'll be like, bro, just stay on defense. We got it. We got it on the line. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, they, they got it taken care of. I, 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 I just go get my rest when they're on the field. Let them do their do they work. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is Gallery Shot. I'm Jim Renier, and coming up next is more Inside the Walls podcast here on episode 86, Guns Up. That was Cody Brooks of the San Antonio Gunslingers. I want to say thank you to Cody um, getting in depth. Did tease kind of maybe a New Jersey reveal, but overall, you would expect what a player respect. Talked about his playing time in the career. So, again, thank you for joining our show, uh, Cody. And for the fans of San Antonio, you learn more about Cody Brooks and what the possible the season is. It's a uh, <laughs> bare and tricky. But the one thing that made me uh, laugh, you if you laugh in an interview, is that what fullback gives him the hardest time? He always loved going up against Zach Brown. And I was like, you know what? Nice. That, Zach Brown always does that to players. And guess what? He gets that chance in week one when the Carolina Cobras come to town to take on the San Antonio Gunslinger. And speaking of the San Antonio Gunslinger, tickets are on sale, of course, at SanAntonioGunslingers.com or visit Ticketmaster for season and single game tickets. Now, let's look at that schedule, my friend. Yes, please. So as as we mentioned, uh, 12 game schedule, but here's the caveat for them. This is something that you got to feel real good if you're trying to say keeping guys well juiced and well, I think, adapted to a late season run. They have five bye weeks in this in this schedule. Keep that in mind. So like not only do they have five bye weeks, but they're spread out throughout the season you get two of them kind of in the early going. You have that week 10 bye right there between that home stretch and then you end the year with two more i mean you know we talk a lot about how iron man you can kind of get beaten up a little bit uh mm -hmm. you have to be really physically prepared for this type of brand of football and to have that so stretches so that players can kind of rest their muscles a lot more um that's beneficial i mean think about, i mean jesus man we talked about last year how the cobras and sharks went without a bye and how that you wonder had to could have been a factor in how the Cobras couldn't kind of finish the deal over in Albany. But, you know, in this case, I mean, that's kind of one of the benefits, even though they are playing an awkward schedule with 12 games instead of the 14. Um, that's nice. And, again, their, their schedule is balanced not only by buys, but also just kind of how they go stretches. I mean, they start off with the Cobras, but, like, they do have a quick stretch of, of away games, but then they get a stretch of home games in the middle of the season, and then they get a bit of a sprinkling at the end. So not too shabby. Um, you got to like that. Uh Few few keys, Jim. You want to highlight those? Oh, the the few keys of the game. I, I'm well, not key, keys of the game. Yeah, we're talking about. I guess games, key matchups, right? key portions about this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, oh man, uh, I am so. I don't know what's going on with me. Hold on a second. I lost. Wait a minute. I'm not supposed to lose. Let me see the script. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see the script. Let's get back on track here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, uh, the keys of the you know the keys of any type of schedule. You have key games, but the one thing I forgot to mention in the pre-show is that bye week of week seventeen. That is so beneficial for a team, especially for a team that wants to make a playoff push. Like you see in the National Football League, you want to be the team that has a bye. You don't have to want to play in the first round. Mm -hmm. You have a you you clinch a playoff spot. And you have to, and you're chilling week 17, and you're healthy going into the playoffs. That is, you know, beneficial for an yeah. organization like San Antonio, especially if you're home for the playoff game. 
yeah, uh, that's one thing I forgot to mention. But there, but speaking of their schedule, one thing that really pops up to mind is we're talking about how their championship caliber team, how they could play for the playoffs. But again, like we mentioned before in the Albany uh, segment, you come out the king, you better not miss. No. They go on the so the highlight games of their schedule is week three and week twelve matchup against the Albany Empire, both in Albany and in San Antonio. Those are the two key crucial matchups. Are they the team that dethrones the Kings? Well, you play them twice, possibly three times. <laughs> that third time could be in the postseason. Um, but yeah, you look at this matchup. You look at all the, the teams around the league right now. It's it's showing from our perspective. 1A, 1B is Albany and San Antonio. Week 3 and Week 12 will determine if that is legitimately the schedule uh, between the two teams. Or what is the legit schedule? Duh. Uh, (laughs) I'm having an off day today, folks. I'm sorry. Uh, It will determine if they are legit top two teams in the league or is that their third or fourth team in there? Well, I I think we're comparing this to like last year how – you know, out of the gate, like remember last year we were talking about the Cobras and the Empire were Correct. kind of those matchups, same deal. So if you want to talk about like how we hyped up each one of those type of um, type of competitions every year, like last season, this is kind of what we're highlighting because Albany, and it's funny how Jonathan Bain is going to be in this conversation once more, yeah. just a different shade of, <laughs> shade of colors in red, white, and blue. But those are key matchups, not only I think for series wins, because remember this is, there's no divisions in the NAL. It's one set seven team roster. So tiebreakers are important in terms of who wins the season matchup, you know, overall, there's only two. So you hope you, if you're either of these teams, if it comes to that, you lose one, you hope you get a rubber match and you can win or you can get win and kind of tie that up. There's no rubber match, but you know what I'm getting the second matchup you want to tie. You don't want to get swept. So for the gunslingers, these are important matchups. And the first one, they get to go away and are going to be in that, you know, rowdy crowd over at the MVP arena. But that's the thing. If you win that first one in week three, well, then you get to invite guys back to Freeman Coliseum all the way in San Antonio, which, as we saw and as we expect, it's going to be a pretty nice and very passionate crowd in San Antonio this year uh, for all things considered. So those two matchups, I mean, that can determine, you know, at the very least, it, it can determine home field advantage if these two teams are the championship team. I mean, if San Antonio say they sweep the Empire, and bolt and then and say they finish with a better record by just maybe a like a game or two. Mm-hmm. Guess who's going to San Antonio for a championship? It's Albany. Yeah, it's Albany. You know, it, otherwise vice versa. You you then realize, remember Albany? You've seen last two years they post the championship. If you're the Gunslingers and you have to go to Albany, that's a trek and that's a hard place to play in a championship mm-hmm. environment. So keep matchups that have long all season implications, especially for July and possibly August. And of course, especially with the unbound schedule for a San Antonio, if you sweep, if that's a, if they do a two-step sweep, they'll have most likely a better winning percentage. And in this day and age, you look at and people are going to ask, how did the standings look? Uh, it's not like the classic game is back; it's winning percentage. And if you if you're just point one winning percentage better than that team below you, you you have the tiebreaker uh, mm-hmm. because. Again, Carolina and San Antonio are the only two teams in the league that play uh, – uh, not Carolina, San, excuse me. Um, San Antonio and Orlando play 12 games. Everyone else plays 14. But that's yes. a crucial point. And I know they're going to have some people maybe commenting on this and say we're, we're basically comparing San Antonio to Carolina last year. Uh, there's no comparison between the two teams. Uh, the two teams are were completely built differently. Um, we did favor Carolina heavy last year because how they performed, but this is just preseason again. Paper, you can be a, a elite roster on paper, and if you don't go out there and execute on games, you will lose in this league. I don't care who you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you- best players i've seen teams in the past have the most expensive rosters in the arena game and they end up only winning four games that season and they're four games back in the playoffs so there's a lot of things that need to be done but again how we think in this offseason how san antonio is going to be this year the games that matter the most are going to be if they are who they are who they want to be they got to prove it against the guys on top and that is the albany empire yeah without a doubt so those matchups alone 
you know, I think you're going to be watching out for that. I mean, it's a game of a, it's the game of the week for week three for us already. So mm-hmm. if it doesn't show you how important we feel this is going to be to kind of have later season implications, that's one if you're going to tune in for any NAL game, uh, say that week in, in particular, or if you're just, say you're busy those first two weeks and you can, it's a can't-miss game, that is a can't-miss game. You, you have to tune in for that one. That is going to be good football being played out there first off in the Capital Region. Um, I think some other keys to here. So uh, one thing is, yeah, we're going to have the Texas showdown with West Texas in the early going. Um, and I think we we highlight this one much like we highlighted West Texas where, with with San Antonio where it's, you know, it's two Texas teams. It's, you know, getting that first exposure of, you know, having an in-state, at least you can have an in-state kind of setup now. Um, I know there's it's still a bit of a trek for both cities I thought by road a little bit because Texas is a huge, huge state. But nonetheless, you know, you can build that kind of on, like on the road kind of feel like, you know, say if you do have diehard fans that want to go travel to Odessa or say you have Odessa fans that want to, you know, take a bit of a road trip over to San Antonio, you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of the start of it. We're more highlighting this because with another Texas team, it's great to see that, you know, we get to have that in-state action and it kind of helps to help build a foundation for that section of the league as we move forward in future seasons. Oh, of course. And if you get Odessa or West Texas and San Antonio to be that rival, like in say Florida already has one between Florida and between Orlando and Jacksonville, that's already been a rivalry for years. And yeah. We're trying to get the Carolina series going with between Fayetteville and Carolina. Um, rivalries are what makes sports great. And without a, a legit rival, yeah, you can go through the season like, oh, it's just a normal season. You want that game to be on your schedule. Like, you know, we got West Texas this year. It's hashtag hate West Texas week or hashtag hate San Antonio week. Well, the hashtags, all these fan bases. And sometimes, especially for a certain character out of West Texas, I think he'll be happy to start chaos uh, <laughs> with the gunner. Yeah. So uh, it, it, we're just doing this as a key series because West Texas is in the state of uh, – now, of course, state of Texas. And again, shorter travel, but then again, Texas is a big state. So really, it's not a short travel, <laughs> to say the least. But still, it, it beats the hell out of a, you know, a 20-hour plane, what, a five-hour plane flight to Albany, 22-hour oh, yeah. drive, whatever that is. Uh, so yeah, local rivalries is something cool. And for San Antonio, uh, when their closest team last year was the Columbus Lions, now they got someone in their own state. So it can build up a little hate, not hatred, but especially travel may be an issue, but it'd be cool to see both fan bases and both arenas uh, to try and really build it up. So uh, is there really a rivalry between these two teams? Uh, not really, but it's something right. that'd be cool if it does develop. In-state matchups, I think are nice. And again, you get, it's a road trip that you can have, you know, it's a little, which also that's something I think I stress. We, we talk about this sometimes in terms of the business of this sport. Travel is a huge expense for Correct. these teams. Um, bus bus fares are cheaper than airfare, um, so that's something. It's a reasonable reasonable drive for bus. I I stress because remember San Antonio had to do an emergency long distance trip last year. That was not that was not supposed to be in the cards. But like, you know, this is not this is good to have. A, like I said, an in state guy like this that you get to play against. And I think for West Texas for them, it's it, it's another witness. It's a litmus test game to kind of see where Coach Coach Smith's own team is at. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but again, yeah, th- this one you can't complain about. I, I'm very excited to see these two get to kind of chop it up. And again, whoever is, uh, to me, diehards of their teams, because there you know, there's some diehard fans in San Antonio, really just for football in general right now. I mean, we can mention the XFL real quick just for how that that's set up. And those guys actually got a little bit of praise uh, from yeah. that team. Uh, got to go out to that home opener um, and got invited out there. It is a five-hour drive, but five hours – I mean, it, there's way worse drives. Um, oh, yeah, of course, but, like the 21-hour like, drive to Carolina. <laughs> but no, yeah, yeah, but no joke. I mean, look, I like for me, I wish I had. I went Indianapolis, but I wish that I had a five-hour drive to an NAL team. Um, and diehard fans will make that trek. That's that's reasonable for a road trip for especially those that really, really love their team and want to like make sure they go to as many games as possible. I I wouldn't be surprised you see some guys in gunslingers gear over in Odessa or hopefully vice versa over in Freeman. I think so. I think they're, well, of course you got the family members that travel that doesn't count. We're, we're talking about the actual fans who are, they have a 
their team and they're traveling there because we see in every single other league, college, whatever. They're certain teams travel, mm-hmm. um, especially for us. I know we have a group that goes down to Orlando all the time, and occasionally I think they go up to Carolina. But there is a group, and there's a group from Orlando that comes up to Jacksonville. So right, those are de- dedicated fans. And for me, hey, builds up a rivalry. It keeps the energy and puts fans in the stands, and that's see, what I, this I, league needs. See, I haven't heard this yet, but I would love to see this happen. The more, the more you get these guys involved, mm-hmm. um, like how Jacksonville does it with Orlando bus trips. Like I think that would be a freaking awesome thing to set up. Again, that's that's enough. That's like right on the fringe of a distance where a road trip is reasonable, and you can do a bus trip in a day. Like do a weekend kind of like package with folks that are diehard fans. Get a bunch of people on a bus, travel up to Odessa. You know, buy like a certain section of your of the hangar and like let them be there or vice versa. You know, the hangar comes over to Freeman. You know, I'm not saying that's happening. That's more just me kind of like trying to manifest it because I think that'd be a great package for those two teams to work on. But that's available now, too. So this is like to me, we highlighted because it's the beginning of that Texas relationship. You know, big deal for the league to kind of have two teams now out in that state to promote. And I've I didn't say it. my coach in high school even said like rivalries are born from the unexpected moment meaning it, you can you, we can try to force this to be a rivalry <laughs> right and even it may not even become one there's a point in there like how columbus and jacksonville became a rival it wasn't because the previous two games they played in the regular season it was we bash our, our buddy john mason espinoza it's the fumble snap in the championship game that made that rivalry become a rivalry Man. because it's that one that play that you didn't expect lose or win that really turns that turns it around and makes it a rival so one good team, snap away he says he could have gotten it they say well, they could have won I, I that ba- one with that. i bash gibson and he literally like hey no watch this i'm like oh yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> so but Speaking of which, uh, there were other news that was dropped in the National Realm via uh, Commissioner Siegfried, and we want to get that before we let you guys out for this beautiful evening here on a lovely Friday in the United States, five weeks away from kickoff of NAL season, Mm -hmm. and that we have new rules going on for the 2023 season, and these rules are, you know, similar. There is now horse collar tackle rule of penalties that is going to be in an effect, which um, honestly, I, I didn't realize that wasn't a penalty in NL. That was my bad. Um, uh, other ones yeah. is a substitution ref. So when their players substituting for different players on the field, they actually go have to get checked in uh, similar to how you see in soccer and rugby and in um, hockey, not hockey, um, oh, basketball, NBA, basically, basketball, you yeah. know, and also, you have a rule. You got the five-yard halo rule, meaning you can't hit the guy who's receiving the ball five yards, meaning it's the five-yard line. You can't mm-hmm. tackle the guy until he either touches the football, catches the football, or the ball hits the ground. You can't pass the five-yard line is that rule. And also, when we mentioned about kickers, you have to have a good kicker. The NAL is having nothing of kickers kicking the ball out of bounds. Now, field goals are different. I think you can still play that as, you know, punt. It's, it's different. Um, but kickoffs, you got to keep everything in the field of play because they want returns to happen. Therefore, yeah. if you kick the net, hit the net, it's in play. If it hits the wall behind the net, it's a dead ball. If it misses the net from both sides, left and right sides, the receiving team gets a point. And That's huge, it, by the way. Like the, Because, look, they, they wanted so badly last year – there was, of course, football woes across the league. That's been acknowledged at this point in full effect. But oh, he even the coach acknowledges it. They've already made a nickname of that, the Manas well, rule. The Manas rule. <laughs> but, but, and, I mean, they did that because, you know, A, I mean, you go back to last year. Mark Roscoe was down for several weeks, and they didn't have really a rival kicker to kind of get a deuce, and they were having football issues anyway, so what do you do? Okay, the easy, the easy solution because it still has, you know, it's mainly in – it still has – indoor properties without the nets you know we'll kick out of bounds there you go but now with the nets like the league they're they cannot stress enough they want returns they want the arena football aesthetic back in the sport and that's why they put the nets in so they really want to deter from having any chance that you're just gonna boy you're just gonna basically whiff on taking a, on a shot at the net so it's a big penalty because giving a point can change a game just on a kickoff. Yep. I mean, if you're if you're 
knowing arena, you know, if you're within one point and you got the deuce rule, say you're going for a, like, say you're going for a deuce and say you whiff on the kick and that thing slails out of bounds because you didn't get the right angle. I mean, that's huge. That can go from a one point to a tie and the possession goes back and forth. Like that's, this is stuff that strategy we're talking about right now. You know, that it's, you have to play smart and you have to be on your A game to do the, to do this and not give up a point. So big deal. Um, yeah, and with plenty of implications. And also, if if the kicker kicks over the net, it's not it's no, the no, ball no. the ball be placed at the ten yard line. One thing I've noticed is everything is being placed on the ten yard line. If you shank the kick, the receiving team gets a ball and gets a ball in the ten. There's no more twenty five yard line, twenty yard line. It's all it's all universal ten yard line. So it helps the benefit of the uh, uh, defense too, or mm-hmm. yeah, defense, offense, whatever. But mostly the defense too, uh, strategy wise. Also, the one thing that is going to be introduced in this season. Um, that I'm honestly I'm kind of looking forward to it is the rule of the subs not really like the, the replay system it's going to be a lot quicker it's going to be you're not going to be able to slow down the game intentionally to review it has to be it's a more prompt prompt way they're going to do it quicker faster um, the rules are going to be different, but one thing about it that he kind of the Siegfried, uh, Commissioner Siegfried segue to it was the one minute rule, the new one minute rule. Yeah. Um, if a team's up by 25 points or more, um, the team that's winning can take a knee. They can victory formation it, but if it's under 25 points, you have to get positive yardage to get it. So more strategy is going to be involved into this season. Uh, for offensive teams and defensive teams. But one of the reasons why they're doing, if a team's up by 25 points or more, the receiving team can kneel the ball or run the uh, to To kneel the ball in victory formation is for the safety of the players. Mm-hmm. Um, usually from what Minas says, uh, they're finding out that more injuries happen to players when the game is completely out of control and they're out there still playing 100% or hard, um, even though the game should be like that with a minute left it's safety of the players it's also to speed up the game like you know right. we're like we're not it's up by 25 the chances of a 25 point lead to go away in the, in the under minute are very slim to none i don't even think and, and i that. i want to stress i'm glad that they did it where it's in only in blowouts and i know that you know things can still get hectic at the end of the game but the former leagues and even some current have made rules that it's basically like doesn't matter the score we'll just kneecap the last minute and make it where you can knee down and walk away. And that's, that's so boring to me. Um, and I was really, I was really wondering if they would, and I'm not shocked that they did change it up to do this, but you know, I was really wondering, will they make an adjustment if they want? Cause I get it. The end of the end of the game, if it's a blowout, things can get a little testy with some players and you don't want to have, you don't want to have some things happen. So I, I understand. So the fact that they put it where they basically said, okay, what's the reasonable amount that a comeback doesn't seem possible in one minute time mm-hmm. and 25 plus is a good amount. So I'm glad that they did it where it's like a best of both worlds where yes, this is possible, but we're also going to acknowledge that this is arena football and we shouldn't kneecap the possibility of a comeback like that. If it still is technically feasible, yes, 20 plus points is harder, but Mm-hmm. That's not beyond impossible hard. It does oh. happen in arena football. So I'm glad that they found a compromise with that ruling because they could have just did the kneecap one minute and say, well, if you got the ball and you advance it, you can just, you know, or if you get within a minute and you don't have to worry about advance, you can just knee it down. Like, no, I'm sorry. I'm glad that they, <laughs> I'm glad that they kept the advance forward rule for that threshold of points below mm-hmm. that set point, because that, that keeps to me at more arena football more so than not. Well, well it, it, technically, it's still a three possessions. Right. 25 points is 21. Uh, Plus, you got the deuce. So yeah. every every possession, you can get upwards of 10 points in the NAL if you think about mm-hmm. it. You know, it's, you can go for two. You can go then kick another two. So you can get 10 in one swing. So that's mm-hmm. 20 points if you are lucky enough and you are able to get it. You can have a 20-point swing with two possessions and two – well, two possessions and two kicks of with course. that. We've we've seen that happen, especially in Jacksonville a couple of years ago with the the touchdown to uh, an extra point, um, and then the re like the weird bounce of the ball that end up in the end zone. Jacksonville recovered. There was a 14, 16 point swing right there, so it can happen like that on a dime. Um, but I like it because a the very the, this rule is interesting, but also 
I'm going to say it's going to be very unlikely we see it this year, probably. We might see it maybe in a game here and a game there, but it's not going to be like every game. There's going to mm-hmm. be a lot of these games that are going to be within two scores of each other. Um, there's going to be the occasional ones, but when they do, it's basically – it's like how baseball is doing – college baseball is doing run rules now. Yeah. Like 10, 10 runs after eight innings or seven innings, yeah, the, the game's over. It, it's the safety of the players and also – speeds up the game and plus like the odds of a team coming back from 25 points down under a minute is slim like maybe two yes. percent chance i don't even i we need people to go look at the records of history of the arena full i know there's been you know 18 point leads a race 19 point lead 20 point leads but not 25 i've seen that happen but i don't remember 25 in my time watching arena again there could be a game i may be missing one and one of our listeners might say well this happened here in 1998 well what game? Um, <laughs> but it's very slim. But you're talking about Manas, Jason Gibson, and Coach uh, and uh, Chris Siegfried, who have coached and co- coached, played in this leagues for many years. So they know what the average, what they know that's possible of a comeback slash turnaround the season. So or turnaround the game, not season. There I go again, just blabbering off. Man, today it sucked for me <laughs> with the conversation. <laughs> but, but anyways, but yeah, it, it, the rules changes, in my opinion, are good for the league. Uh, I had the horse collar is good. I did send a message to a couple of people. I, does the 10-second uh, offensive uh, penalties count again, uh, especially if it results in a penalty, if a team that results in a play that's a running clock, does that? Yes, yeah, I've been told that it still will exist this year, so – um, but overall, from what I can tell, uh, Chris Sigfrey has really put a focus on the officiating this year, uh, which has been a topic would, of past years. Yeah, I mean, they hinted that they put some money into training, which was uh, – yeah. that had been discussed midseason, by the way, last year. They had yeah. needed to think of something to do, and they they put money back in. Joe Clarkson's probably real happy to hear that they're doing active training again on officiating because, we, as we acknowledged, it was needed, and it's mm-hmm. going to be – it should help a lot with dedicated arena football rules and committed to kind of getting guys that know the game right out of the gate, or at least they're better set to begin the season out of the gate, knowing what's needed to be done, not to throw everyone under the bus, but like just to have a better starting point than last Mm -hmm. year is huge, especially with iron man. Yeah. And of, and of course the substitution ref will help both teams. It will help the flow of the game, the new challenging rules and, the intentionally trying to slow down the game, the challenge, a useless penalty or mm-hmm. use of play that you know it shouldn't be challenged. Uh, a lot of stuff is going to be changed. And from what Chris Siegfried said today on the Albany Empire show, um, is that the rule books will be given to the player coaches by camp, and then it will be released on the website and to us fans right around mid camp. So about maybe two weeks before the season starts. So. Here was another thing that I think was key that was in his con- conversation. And I think gunslingers fans just from some examples last year would definitely be happy to see this. Um, they're trying to get a dedicated replay official. Um, yeah. So to speed up that process, which I agree with completely. Um, Cause look, that's why I was men about the replay official. Why I kept saying the challenging replay. Yeah. yeah well, they, you know what you were saying, but like I said, I think <laughs> if anything, I'm reiterating because look, the time for the guys to go over to the video monitor and get things set up, that is its own right, slows the game down. But I think to have someone who's watching the stadium feed out of the gate and can kind of already go, you know, think of like the command center between the USFL and XFL. Basically, this isn't, say, a centralized location, but you have someone that they're trying to dedicatedly have for every one of the games, for all seven teams, watching the video and going, okay, I already have a preset feel on this let me go back real quick like that that time is important you know and especially for fans and then people in the arena it's really important to kind of speed that process up yeah. to have someone that knows the game and can instantly go to the officials like okay here's what i see yeah. you know and this is what i'm going to be ruling on or give you guys official ruling on so that's also great like a lot of good stuff positive wise they have put down and that they've mm-hmm. started voting on in the last few months that there's going to be some good results from those choices yeah. and also when I was when I meant about slowing the game down, we've known coaches that just throw challenge flags. They know they're not going to win the challenge. They're just doing it because they know the the replay is going to take five to ten minutes to get you know done because mm-hmm. it's arena football and that'd be a, you know extended of the time. That's what I would mean about speeding up the game um, because we've had some arena football games last year that were three and a half hours long, and that's yeah. long for an arena game. 
Um, but it looks like one thing that we, we've seen this off season and what Chris has done and what Manas and coach Gibson, who are part of the official and uh, Clarkson have done is that they're putting a focus on time, safety and betterment of play. And for a arena game for to be in his peak physique of performance, everything has to be aligned with each other. And I think this off season was them trying to put everything like, this is what we need to do to get these games to be run perfectly with, there will be stumblings. There will be hiccups. It happens in every sport, but they're trying to find a way to make these games run smoothly without massive delays that were either substitution related, replay related, um, Convert like penalty related stuff to just you know, know speed up the game and trying to get this game to be under three hours It'd be exciting and if it's over three hours that means you're going to overtime or halftime yeah. is exciting and also how I think he, did he say the half times are going to be shorter uh, this year I think that they were trying to kind of balance that because here's the thing every team's got their own promotions at halftime so this is a to me I think that I wouldn't say touchy. But it's definitely a subject you have to you have to finagle around the best yeah. way possible. Because I mean, we know the sharks, the, the sharks, the empire. They do a lot of different promotions and things between mm-hmm. you know TV timeouts, between half times, and all that. You know, so I think that they are. So yeah, they are targeting to limit those times. I'm curious how much they'll limit because of just some of the promotion aspects. Yeah. But I think a lot of this year's focus is on controlling the length of games and making sure the rules are as crisp and clean as possible. Because they, they, as we've talked, I mean, they're they're trying to be a, a professional top tier, tier league. They are to us right now in terms of the arena space. But I think publicly, we are trying to see this league grow beyond just the diehard fandom and see guys that go, oh yes, this is arena football. I remember this sport. I want to jump back in. You know, so this is a big year for the NAL um, in those fronts, and that's a lot of that stuff is to push towards that direction. Yeah. But for that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've been here blasting your ear for long, far too long. It's been an hour and 30 <laughs> minutes. Thank you again, Cody Brooks. Big news out of Albany with the Empire and Eddie Brown and Antonio Brown coming back home. And San Antonio, you got this guy have a squad. Um, there's a lot of players we can really deep dive. Uh, we will have more interviews. We, again, San Antonio players, San Antonio family. Week one, you are the inside the walls game of the week. Uh, Cobra's at oh, yeah. the San Antonio Gunslingers. We will have another player on the team uh join if you want if you have a player that you, you have in mind you want on the show send us comment us on our this, uh, twitter facebook youtube and we'll get him on the show for week one uh for the season also we'll have travel we're going i'm going to get travis shaw on week one too so we might have a double feature of player and coach so game of the week is carolina and san antonio for week one but for that any of the last thoughts Zach? Uh, should be a fun year NAL wise, but look for the gunslingers just to reiterate, you know, you guys have, you know, I, I think a plenty to be excited about, um, this rot, like I said, the rot, as we talked, the roster very well put together from the, from preseason perspective, um, and plenty of guys returning that, I mean, it's a good year and it's a good, really good ownership group that San Antonio has. Um, go and support this team. You know, you love you love the ba- love of the Brahmas are there. You loved how you saw the sa- the Gunslingers at the end of last year. Keep supporting your spring and local football. The Gunslingers are going to be here. They want to stay for the years to come. So go check them out. Keep on supporting your Gunslingers, and uh, you know, go see some exciting football over there in Freeman. It's going to be a hell of a year for them. Uh, and from what me and you have said earlier in the show, they're a playoff team. We believe that they are. A we playoff believe they team. are. Yeah, so- we think that they're a lock. So don't come at us in week 10, San Antonio fans. You guys didn't predict us doing anything. We think, yeah, we've had to go to the playoffs. <laughs> but, but anyways, ladies and gentlemen, I am Jim Renier. That is Zach Kyleman. This has been Inside the Walls Up Podcast, episode 86. Next week, uh, a little home cooking for me as we break down the Jacksonville Sharks 2023 campaign with a famous offensive lineman slash defense lineman. He's been around Canada and the United States. Announcement of him will be coming in a couple of days. I'm Jim. That's Zach. This is Inside the Walls Podcast. We'll see you guys next week. Covering all your favorite parts of the 50-yard fight. This is the Inside the Walls Podcast with Zach Kyleman and Jim Bernier. <laughs>